We nailed down our little hiccup yet? Sir? Is the odd reading? No, sir. Tale of the Ragged Mountains by Edgar Allan Poe During the fall of the year 1827, while residing near Charlottesville, Virginia, I casually made the acquaintance of Mr. Augustus Bedlow. This young gentleman was remarkable in every respect, and excited me in a profound interest and curiosity. I found it impossible to comprehend him, either in his moral or his physical relations. Of his family, I could obtain no satisfactory account. Whence he came, I never ascertained. Even about his age, although I call him a young gentleman, there was something which perplexed me in no little degree. He certainly seemed young, and he made a point of speaking about his youth, yet there were moments when I should have had little trouble in imagining him a hundred years of age. But in no regard was he more peculiar than his personal appearance. He was singularly tall and thin. He stooped much. His limbs were exceedingly long and emaciated. His forehead was a broad low. His complexion was absolutely bloodless. His mouth was large and flexible, and his teeth were more wildly uneven, although sound, than I had ever seen before seen in a human head. The expression of his smile, however, was by no means unpleasing, as might be supposed, but it had no variation whatsoever. It was one of profound melancholy, of a phaseless and unceasing gloom. His eyes were abnormally large with, and round like those of a cat. The pupils, too, upon any accession or diminution of light, underwent a contraction or dilation, just such as observed in the feline tribe. In most moments of excitement, the orbs grew bright to a degree almost inconceivable, seeming to admit luminous rays, not of a reflected, but of a intrinsic luster, as does a candle or the sun. Yet their ordinary con condition was, was totally vapid, filmy, and dull, as it, to convey the idea of the eyes of a long interred corpse. These peculiarities of a person appeared to cause him much annoyance, and he was continually alluding to them in a sort of half-explanatory, half-apologetic strain, which, when I first heard it, impressed me painfully. I soon, however, grew accustomed to it, and my unease wore off. It seemed to be his design rather to insinuate than to directly assert that physically he had not always been what he was, that a long series of neurologic attacks had reduced him from a condition of more than usual personal beauty, and to which I saw. For many years past he had been attended to by a physician named Templeton, an old gentleman, perhaps seventy years of age, whom he first encountered at Saratoga, and from whose attention, while there, he either received or fancied that he received great benefit. The result was that Bedloe, who was wealthy, had made an arrangement with Dr. Templeton, by which the latter, in consideration of a liberal annual allowance, had consented to devote his time and his medical experience exclusively to the care of the invalid. Dr. Templeton had been a traveler in his younger days, and at Paris had become a convert, in great measure, to the doctrines of Mesmer. It was altogether by means of magnetic remedies that he had succeeded in alleviating the acute pains of his patients, and this success had very naturally inspired the latter with a certain degree of confidence in the opinions from which the, re the remedies had been adduced. The doctor, however, like all enthusiasts, had struggled hard to make it a thorough convert of his people, and finally so far gained his point as to induce the sufferer to submit to numerous experiments. 
by a frequent repetition of these, a result had arisen, which of late days had become so common as to attract little or no attention, by which, at the period of which I write, had very rarely been known in America. I mean to say that between Dr. Templeton and Bedloe, there had grown up, little by little, a very distinct and strongly marked rapport, or magnetic relation. I am not prepared to assert, however, that this rapport extended beyond the limits of the simple sleep-producing powder, but this power itself had attained a great intensity. At the first attempt to adduce the magnetic somnolency, the mesmerist entirely failed. In the fifth or sixth, he succeeded very partially, and after a long continued effort, only at the twelfth was their triumph complete. After this, the will of the patient succumbed rapidly to that of the physician, so that when I first became acquainted with the two, sleep was brought on about almost instantaneously by the mere volition of the operator, even when the invalid was unaware of his presence. It is only now, in the year 1845, when similar miracles are witnessed daily by thousands, that I dare to venture to record this apparent impossibility as a matter of serious fact. The temperature of Bedloe was in the highest degree sensitive, excitable, enthusiastic. His imagination was singularly vigorous and creative, and no doubt it delivered additional force from the habitual use of the morphine, which he swallowed in great quantity, and without which he would have found it impossible to exist. It was his practice to take very large dose of it immediately after breakfast each morning, or rather immediately after a cup of strong coffee, for he ate nothing in the forenoon, and then set forth alone, or attended only by a dog, upon a long ramble among the chain of wild and dreary hills that lie westward and southward of Char Charlottesville, and are the dignified by the title of the Ragged Mountains. Upon a dim, warm, misty day, towards the close of November, and during a strange interim of the seasons in which America is termed the Indian summer, Mr. Bedloe departed as usual for the hills. The day passed, and still he did not return. About eight o'clock at night, having become seriously alarmed at the protracted absence, we were about setting out in search for him, when he unexpectedly made his appearance, in health no worse than usual, and in rather more than ordinary spirits. The account which he gave of his expedition and of the events which had detained him was singular one indeed. You will remember, he said, that it was about nine in the morning when I left Charlottesville. I bent my steps immediately to the mountains, and about ten entered a gorge which was entirely new to me. I followed the windings of this pass with much interest, the scenery which presented itself on all sides, although scarcely entitled to be called grand, has about it an indescribable and to me delicious aspect of a dreary desolation. The solitude seemed absolutely virgin. I could not help believing that the green sods and the gray rocks upon which I trod had been trodden never before by the foot of a human being so entirely secluded and in fact inaccessible except through a series of accidents as the entrance of this ravine, that by no means impossible that I was indeed the first adventurer, the very first and sole adventurer, who had ever penetrated its recesses. The thick and peculiar mist or smoke which distinguishes the Indian summer, and which now hung heavily over all the objects, served no doubt to deepen the vague impression which these objects created, so dense was the pleasant fog that I could at no time see more than a dozen yards of the path in front of me. The path was excessively sinuous, and the sun could not be seen. I soon lost all idea of the direction in which I had journeyed. In the meantime, the morphine had its customary effect, that of 
subduing all the external world with an intensity of interest in the quivering of a leaf and the hue of a blade of grass and the shape of a trefoil and the humming of a bee and the gleaming of a dewdrop and the breathing of the wind and the faint odors that came from the forest there came a whole universe of suggestion a gay motley train of rhapsodical and immethodical thought busied in this i walked for several hours during which the mist deepened around me and set an extent that at length I was reduced to absolute groping of the way. And now an indescribable uneasiness possessed me, a species of nervous hesitation and tremor. I feared to tread lest I should be precipitated into some abyss. I remember two strange stories about these ragged hills and of the uncouth and fierce races of men who tenanted their groves and caverns a thousand vague fancies oppressed and disconsorted me fancies the more disturbing because vague very suddenly my attention was arrested by the loud beating of a drum my amazement was of course extreme a drum in these hills was a thing unknown i could not have been more surprised at the sound of the trump of an archangel but a new and still more sounding source of interest and perplexity rose there came a wild rattling or jingling sound as if a bunch of large keys and upon the instant a dusky visaged and half-naked man rushed past me with a shriek he came so close to my person that i felt his hot breath on my face he bore in one hand an instrument composed of an assemblage of steel rings and shook them vigorously as he ran scarcely as he had disappeared in the mist before, panting after him with an open mouth and glaring eyes, there darted a huge beast. It could not be mistaken in its character. It was a hyena. The sight of this monster rather relieved than heightened my terrors, for I now made sure that I dreamed, and I endeavored to arouse myself to a waking consciousness. I stepped boldly and briskly forward. I rubbed my eyes. I called aloud. I pinched my limbs. A small spring of water presented itself now in my view, and here, stooping, I bathed my hands and my head and my neck. This seemed to dissipate the equivocal sensations which had hitherto annoyed me. I arose, as I thought, a new man, and proceeded steadily and complacently on my own unknown way. At length, quite overcome by exertion, and by a certain oppressive closeness of the atmosphere, I seated myself beneath a tree. Presently there came a feeble gleam of sunshine, and the shadow of the leaves of the tree fell faintly but deftly upon the grass. At this shadow I gazed wonderingly for many minutes. Its character stupefied me with astonishment. I looked upward. The tree was a palm. I now arose hurriedly, and in a state of fearful agitation, for the fancy that I had dreamed would serve me no longer, I saw, I felt that I had perfect command of my senses. And these senses now brought to my soul the world of novel and singular sensation. The heat became all at once intolerable. A strange odor loaded the breeze, a low, continuous murmur, like that arising from a full but gently flowing river, came to my ears, intermingled with a peculiar hum of multitudes of human voices. While I listened, in an extremity of astonishment which I need not attempt to describe, a strong and brief gust of wind bore off the incumbent fog as if by the wand of an enchanter i found myself at the foot of a high mountain and looking down to the vast plain through which wound a majestic river on the margin of this river stood an eastern looking city which we read of in the arabian tales but the character even more singular than any there described from my position, which was far above the level of the town, I could perceive its every nook and corner, as if delineated on a map. The streets seemed innumerable, and crossed each other irregularly in all directions, but were rather long and winding alleys than streets, and absolutely swarmed with inhabitants. The houses were 
wildly picturesque. On every hand, a wilderness of balconies, of verandas, of minarets, of shrines, of fantastically carved orioles, bazaars abound, and these were displayed rich wares in infinite variety and profusion, silks, muslins, and the most dazzling cutlery, the most magnificent jewels and gems. Besides these things were seen on all sides banners, palaquins, litters with stately dames closely veiled, elephants gorgeously caparisoned, idols grotesquely hewn, drums, banners, and gongs, spears, silver, and gilded maces, amid the crowd and the clamor, and the general intricacy and confusion, amid the million of black and yellow men turbaned and robed, and a flowing beard, there roamed a countless multitude of holy filleted bulls, while vast legions of the filthy but sacred ape clamored, chattering and shrieking about the cornices of the mosques, or clung in the minarets and orals. From the swarming streets to the banks of the river, there descended an innumerable flights of steps leading to bathing places, where the river itself seemed to forge a passage with difficulty through the vast fleets of deeply burthened ships that far and wide encountered its surfaces. Beyond the limits of the city arose, in a frequent majestic group, the palm and the coca, with other gigantic and weird trees of vast age, and here and there might be seen a field of rice, the thatched hut of a peasant, a tank, a stray temple, a gypsy camp, or a solitary graceful maiden taking her way with a pitcher upon her head to the banks of the magnificent river. You will say now, of course, that I dreamed, but not so. What I saw, what I heard, what I felt, what I thought, I had about it nothing of the unmistakable idiosyncrasy of a dream. It was all rigorously self-concentric. At first, doubting that I was really awake, I entered into a series of tests which I soon convinced me that I really was. Now when one dreams, and in the dream suspects that he dreams, the suspicion never fails to confirm itself, and the sleeper is almost immediately aroused. Thus novelists errs not in saying, we are near waking when the dream that we dream. Had the vision occurred to me as I described it, without my suspecting it as a dream, then a dream might absolutely have been, but occurring it as it did, and suspecting and tested as it was, I am forced to class it among other phenomena. In this I am not sure that you are wrong, observed Dr. Templeton. But proceed. You arose and descended into the city. I arose continued Bedloe, regarding the doctor with an air of profound astonishment. I arose, as you say, and descended into the city. On my way I fell in with an immense populace, crowding through every avenue, all the same direction, and ex exhibiting in every action the wildest excitement. Very suddenly, and by some inconceivable impulse, I became intensely imbued with personal interest in what was going on. I seemed to feel that I had an important part to play, without exactly understanding what it was. Against the crowd which environed me, however, I experienced a deep sentiment of animosity. I shrank from amid them, and swiftly, by a circuitous path, reached and entered the city. Here all was the wildest tumult and contention. A small party of men, clad in garments half Indian, half European, and officered by a gentleman in a uniform, partly British, were engaged at great odds with the swarming rabble of the alleys. I joined the weaker party, arming myself with the weapons of a fallen officer, and fighting I knew not whom with the nervous ferocity of despair. We were soon overpowered by numbers and driven to seek refuge in a species of kiosk. Here we barricaded ourselves and for the present were secure. From a loophole near the summit of the kiosk, I perceived a vast crowd 
in furious agitation surrounding and assaulting a gay palace that overhung the river. Presently, from the upper window of this place, there descended an effeminate-looking person, by means of a string made of turbans of the attendants. A boat was at hand, in which he escaped to the opposite bank of the river. And now a new object took possession of my soul. I spoke a few hurried but energetic words to my companions, and, having succeeded in gaining over a few of them to my purpose, made a frantic sally from the kiosk. We rushed amid crowds and surrounded it. They retreated at first before us. They rallied, fought madly, and retreated again. In the meantime, we were borne far from the kiosk, and became bewildered and entangled among the narrow streets of tall, overhanging houses, into the recesses of which had the sun had never been able to shine. The rabble pressed impetuously upon us, harassing us with their spears and overwhelming us with a flight of arrows. These latter were very remarkable and resembled in some respects the writhing crests of the Malay. They were made to imitate the body of a creeping serpent, and were long and black, with a poison barb. One of them struck me upon the right temple. I reeled and fell. In an instantaneous and dreadful sickness seized me. I struggled. I gasped. I died. You will hardly persist now, I said, smiling, that the whole of your adventure was not a dream. You are not prepared to maintain that you are dead. When I said these words, I, of course, expected some lively sally from Bedlow in reply, but to my astonishment he hesitated, trembled, became fearfully pallid, and remained silent. I looked toward Templeton. He sat erect and rigid in his chair. His teeth chattered and his eyes were staring from their sockets. Proceed, he said at length, hoarsely to Bedlow. For many minutes, continued the latter, my sole sentiment, my sole feeling, was that of darkness, of non-entity, and when the consciousness of death. At length there seemed to pass a violent and sudden shock through my soul, as if of electricity. With it came the sense of elasticity and of light. This latter I felt, not saw. In an instant I seemed to raise from the ground, but I had no bodily, no visible, no audible, no palatable presence. The crowd had departed. The tumult had ceased. The city was in comparative repose. Behind me lay my corpse, with the arrow in my temple, the whole head greatly swollen and disfigured. But all these things I felt, not saw. I took interest in nothing. Even the corpse seemed a matter in which I had no concern. Volition I had none, but appeared to be impelled into motion, and flitted buoyantly out of the city, retracing the circuitous path by which I had entered it. When I had attained the point of the ravine in the mountains at which I had encountered the hyena, I again experienced a shock of galvanic battery. The sense of weight, of, of volition, of substance returned. I became my original self and bent my steps eagerly homewards. But the past had not lost the vividness of the real. And now, even for an instant, I can compel my understanding to regard it as a dream. Nor was it, said Templeton, with an air of deep solemnity. Yet it would be difficult to say how otherwise I, it should be termed. Let us suppose only that the soul of a man of today is upon the verge of some stupendous cycle discoveries. Let us content ourselves with this supposition. For the rest, I have some explanation to make. Here is a watercolor drawing, which I should have shown you before, but which an unaccountable sentiment of horror has hitherto prevented me from showing. We looked at the picture which he presented. I saw nothing of it of an extraordinary character, but its effect upon Bedloe was 
prodigious. He nearly fainted as he gazed, and yet it was but a miniature portrait, a miraculously accurate one, to be sure, and of his own very remarkable features. At least this was my thought as I regarded it. You will perceive, said Templeton, the date of this picture. It is here, scarcely visible, in the corner, 1780. In this year was the portrait taken. It is the likeness of a dead friend, a Mr. Oldeb, to whom I became much attached at Calcutta. During the administration of the Warring Hastings, I was then only twenty years old when I first saw you, Mr. Bedlow. At Saratoga, it was the miraculous similarity which existed between yourself and the painting which induced me to accost you, to seek your friendship, and to bring about those arrangements which resulted in my becoming your constant companion. In accomplishing this point, I was urged partly and perhaps principally by a regretful memory of the deceased, but also in part by an uneasy, not altogether horrorless curiosity respecting yourself. In your detail of the vision which presented itself to you amid the hills, you have described with minutest accuracy the Indian city of Banaras upon the holy river. The riots, the combat, the massacre were the actual events of the insurrection of the Shit Singh, which took place in 1780, when Hastings was put in imminent peril of his life. The man escaping by the string of turbans was Shit Singh himself. The party in the kiosk were the Sipoys and British officers headed by Hastings. Of this party I was one, and did all I could to prevent the rash and fatal sally of the officer who fell in the crowded alleys. By the poisoned arrow of a Bengali, that officer was my dearest friend. It was Old Eb. You will perceive by these manuscripts. Here the speaker produced a notebook in which several pages appear to have been freshly written. That the very period in which you fancied these things amid the hills, I was engaged in detailing them upon paper here at home. And about a week after this conversation, the following paragraph appeared in the Charlottesville paper. We have the painful duty of announcing the death of Mr. Augustus Bedlow, a gentleman whose amiable manners and many virtuous have long endeared him to the citizens of Charlottesville. Mr. B., for some years past, has been subject to neuralgia, which has often threatened to terminate fatally, but this can be regarded only as the mediate cause of his disease. The proximate cause was one of especial singularity. And in an excursion to the Ragged Mountains, a few days since, a slight cold and fever were contracted, attended with great determination of blood to the head. To relieve this, Dr. Templeton resorted to a topical bleeding. Leeches were applied to the temples. In a fearfully brief period, the patient died and when it appeared that a jar containing the leeches had been introduced by accident, one of the venomous vermicular sanguis, which are now and then found in the neighboring ponds, this creature fastened itself upon a small artery in the right temple. Its close resemblance to the medical leech caused the mistake to be overlooked until too late. N.B. The poisonous Sangue of Charlottesville may always be distinguished from the medical leech by its blackness, and especially by its writhing and vermicular motions, which very nearly resemble those of a snake. I was speaking to the director of the paper in question upon the topic of this remarkable accident, when it occurred to me to ask how it happened that the name of the deceased had been given as Bedlow. I presume, I said, you have authority for this spelling, but I have always supposed the name to be written with an E at the end. Authority? No, he replied. It is a mere typographical error. The name is Bedlow, with an E, all the world over. And I never knew it to be spelt otherwise in my life. Then, I said mutteringly as I turned upon my heel, 
then indeed has it come to pass that one truth is stranger than any fiction, for Bedloe without the E. That is but old Deb conversed, and this man tells me that it is a typographical error? Sure. The ratings are quite interesting. 